capitalism is an economic system based on private ownership of the means of production and the creation of goods and services for profit. Central characteristics of capitalism include private property, capital accumulation, wage labor and competitive markets. In a capitalist market economy, investments are determined by private decision and the parties to a transaction typically determine the prices at which they exchange assets, goods, and services. The degree of competition in markets, the role of intervention and regulation, and the scope of state ownership vary across different models of capitalism. Economists, political economists, and historians have adopted different perspectives in their analyses of capitalism and have recognized various forms of it in practice. These include laissez-faire or free market capitalism, welfare capitalism and state capitalism. Each model has employed varying degrees of dependency on free markets, public ownership, or obstacles to free competition, and inclusion of state-sanctioned social policies. The extent to which different markets are free, as well as the rules defining private property, become matters of politics and a policy. Capitalism has existed under many forms of government, in many different times, places, and cultures. But in modern times it has become dominant and much less restrained. Following the decline of mercantilism, mixed capitalist systems became dominant in the Western world and continue to spread. Etymology The term capitalist, meaning an owner of capital, appears earlier than the term capitalism. It dates back to the mid-17th century. Capitalist is derived from capital, which evolved from capital, a late Latin word based on caput meaning head, also the origin of chattel and cattle in the sense of movable property. Capital emerged in the 12th to 13th centuries in the sense of referring to funds, stock of merchandise, sum of money, or money carrying interest. By 1283 it was used in the sense of the capital assets of a trading firm. It was frequently interchanged with a number of other words, wealth, money, funds, goods, assets, property, and so on. The Hollandische Mercurius uses capitalists in 1633 and 1654 to refer to owners of capital. In French, Etienne Clavier referred to capitalistus in 1788, six years before its first recorded English usage by Arthur Young in his work Travels in France. David Ricardo, in his Principles of Political Economy and Taxation, referred to the capitalist many times. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, an English poet, used capitalist in his work table talk. Pierre Joseph Proudhon used the term capitalist in his first work, What is Property? to refer to the owners of capital. Benjamin Disraeli used the term capitalist in his 1845 work Sybil. The initial usage of the term capitalism in its modern sense has been attributed to Louis Blanc in 1850 and Pierre-Joseph Proudhon in 1861. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels referred to the capitalistic system and to the capitalist mode of production in Das Kapital. The use of the word capitalism in reference to an economic system appears twice in Volume 1 of Das Kapital, 124, and in Theories of Surplus Value, Tome 2. 493. Marx did not extensively use the form capitalism, but instead those of capitalist and capitalist mode of production, which appear more than 2,600 times in the trilogy Das Kapital. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the term capitalism first appeared in English in 1854 in the novel The Newcomes by novelist William Makepeace Thackeray, where he meant having ownership of capital. Also according to the OED, Karl Adolf Dwey, a German-American socialist and abolitionist, used the term private capitalism in 1863. History Capital has existed incipiently on a small scale for centuries, in the form of merchant, renting and lending activities and occasionally also a small-scale industry with some wage labor, simple commodity exchange, and consequently simple commodity production, which form the initial basis for the growth of capital from trade, have a very long history. 
the capitalistic era, according to Marx, dates from the 16th century, i.e., it began with merchant capitalism and relatively small urban workshops. Early Islam promulgated capitalist economic policies, which migrated to Europe through trade partners from cities such as Venice. For the capitalist mode of production to emerge as a distinctive mode of production dominating the whole production process of society, many different social, economic, cultural, technical and legal political conditions had to come together. For most of human history, these did not come together. Capital existed, commercial trade existed, but it did not lead to industrialization and large-scale capitalist industry. That required a whole series of new conditions, namely specific technologies of mass production. The ability to independently and privately own and trade in means of production, a class of workers willing to sell their labor power for a living, a legal framework promoting commerce, a physical infrastructure making the circulation of goods on a large scale possible, security for private accumulation, and so on. In many third world countries, many of these conditions do not exist even today. Even though there is plenty of capital and labor available, the obstacles for the development of capitalist markets are less a technical matter and more a social, cultural and political problem. Capitalism in its modern form can be traced to the emergence of agrarian capitalism and mercantilism in the Renaissance. Agrarian capitalism The economic foundations of the feudal agricultural system began to shift substantially in 16th century England. The manorial system had broken down by this time, and land began to be concentrated in the hands of fewer landlords with increasingly large estates. Instead of a serf-based system of labor, workers were increasingly being employed as part of a broader and expanding money economy. The system put pressure on both the landlords and the tenants to increase the productivity of the agriculture to make profit, the weakened, coercive, power of the aristocracy to extract peasant surpluses encouraged them to try out better methods, and the tenants also had incentive to improve their methods, in order to flourish in an increasingly competitive labor market. Terms of rent for the land were becoming subject to economic market forces rather than the previous stagnant system of custom and feudal obligation. By the early 17th century, England was a centralized state, in which much of the feudal order of medieval Europe had been swept away. This centralization was strengthened by a good system of roads and a disproportionately large capital city, London. The capital acted as a central market hub for the entire country, creating a very large internal market for goods. Instead of the fragmented feudal holdings that prevailed in most parts of the continent, mercantilism the economic doctrine that held sway between the 16th and 18th centuries is commonly described as mercantilism. This period, the Age of Discovery, was associated with the geographic exploration of foreign lands by merchant traders, especially from England and the Low Countries. Mercantilism was a system of trade for profit, although commodities were still largely produced by non-capitalist production methods. Most scholars consider the era of merchant capitalism and mercantilism as the origin of modern capitalism, although Karl Polanyi argued that the hallmark of capitalism is the establishment of generalized markets for what he referred to as the fictitious commodities, land, labor, and money. Accordingly, he argued that, not until 1834 was a competitive labor market established in England, hence industrial capitalism as a social system cannot be said to have existed before that date. England began a large-scale and integrative approach to mercantilism during the Elizabethan era. A systematic and coherent explanation of balance of trade was made public through Thomas Munn's argument England's treasure by foreign trade, or the balance of our foreign trade is the rule of our treasure. It was written in the 1620s and published in 1664. European merchants, backed by state controls, subsidies, and monopolies, made most of their profits from the buying and selling of goods. In the words of Francis Bacon, 
The purpose of mercantilism was the opening and well-balancing of trade, the cherishing of manufacturers, the banishing of idleness, the repressing of waste and excess by sumptuary laws, the improvement and husbanding of the soil, the regulation of prices. The British East India Company and the Dutch East India Company inaugurated an expansive era of commerce and trade. These companies were characterized by their colonial and expansionary powers given to them by nation-states. During this era, merchants, who had traded under the previous stage of mercantilism, invested capital in the East India companies and other colonies, seeking a return on investment. Industrial capitalism A new group of economic theorists, led by David Hume and Adam Smith, in the mid-18th century, challenged fundamental mercantilist doctrines such as the belief that the amount of the world's wealth remained constant and that a state could only increase its wealth at the expense of another state. During the Industrial Revolution, the industrialist replaced the merchant as a dominant factor in the capitalist system and affected the decline of the traditional handicraft skills of artisans guilds, and journeymen. Also during this period, the surplus generated by the rise of commercial agriculture encouraged increased mechanization of agriculture. Industrial capitalism marked the development of the factory system of manufacturing, characterized by a complex division of labor between and within work process and the routine of work tasks, and finally established the global domination of the capitalist mode of production. Britain also abandoned its protectionist policy, as embraced by mercantilism. In the 19th century, Richard Cobden and John Bright, who based their beliefs on the Manchester School, initiated a movement to lower tariffs. In the 1840s, Britain adopted a less protectionist policy, with the repeal of the Corn Laws and the Navigation Acts. Britain reduced tariffs and quotas, in line with David Ricardo's advocacy for free trade. Modern capitalism was carried across the world by broader processes of globalization such as imperialism and, by the end of the 19th century, became the dominant global economic system, in turn intensifying processes of economic and other globalization. Later, in the 20th century, capitalism overcame a challenge by centrally planned economies and is now the encompassing system worldwide with the mixed economy being its dominant form in the industrialized Western world. Industrialization allowed cheap production of household items using economies of scale, while rapid population growth created sustained demand for commodities. Globalization in this period was decisively shaped by 19th century imperialism. After the First and Second Opium Wars and the completion of British conquest of India, vast populations of these regions became ready consumers of European exports. It was in this period that areas of sub-Saharan Africa and the Pacific Islands were incorporated into the world system. Meanwhile, the conquest of new parts of the globe, notably sub-Saharan Africa, by Europeans yielded valuable natural resources such as rubber, diamonds and coal and helped fuel trade and investment between the European imperial powers, their colonies, and the United States. The inhabitant of London could order by telephone, sipping his morning tea, the various products of the whole earth, and reasonably expect their early delivery upon his doorstep. Militarism and imperialism of racial and cultural rivalries were little more than the amusements of his daily newspaper. What an extraordinary episode in the economic progress of man was that age which came to an end in August 1914. The global financial system was mainly tied to the gold standard in this period. The United Kingdom first formally adopted this standard in 1821. Soon to follow was Canada in 1853, Newfoundland in 1865, and the United States and Germany in 1873. New technologies, such as the telegraph, the transatlantic cable, the radio telephone, the steamship and railway allowed goods and information to move around the world at an unprecedented degree. In the period following the global depression of the 1930s, the state played an increasingly prominent role in the capitalistic system throughout much of the world. 
The post-war boom ended in the late 1960s and early 1970s, and the situation was worsened by the rise of stagflation. Monetarism, a modification of Keynesianism that is more compatible with laissez-faire, gained increasing prominence in the capitalist world, especially under the leadership of Ronald Reagan in the US and Margaret Thatcher in the UK in the 1980s. Public and political interest began shifting away from the so-called collectivist concerns of Keynes's managed capitalism to a focus on individual choice called remarketized capitalism. Relationship to democracy The relationship between democracy and capitalism is a contentious area in theory and in popular political movements. The extension of universal adult male suffrage in 19th century Britain occurred along with the development of industrial capitalism, and democracy became widespread at the same time as capitalism, leading capitalists to posit a causal or mutual relationship between them. However, in the 20th century, according to some authors, Capitalism also accompanied a variety of political formations quite distinct from liberal democracies, including fascist regimes, absolute monarchies, and single-party states. Democratic peace theory asserts that democracies seldom fight other democracies, but critics of that theory suggest that this may be because of political similarity or stability rather than because they are democratic or capitalist. Moderate critics argue that though economic growth under capitalism has led to democracy in the past, it may not do so in the future, as authoritarian regimes have been able to manage economic growth without making concessions to greater political freedom. States with capitalistic economic systems have thrived under authoritarian or oppressive political regimes. Singapore has an open market economy and attracts a great deal of foreign investment, but does not protect civil liberties such as freedom of speech and expression. The private sector in the People's Republic of China has grown exponentially and thrived since its inception, despite having an authoritarian government. Augusto Pinochet's rule in Chile led to economic growth and high levels of inequality by using authoritarian means to create a safe environment for investment and capitalism. In Capital in the 21st Century, Thomas Piketty of the Paris School of Economics asserts that inequality is the inevitable consequence of economic growth in a capitalist economy and the resulting concentration of wealth can destabilize democratic societies and undermine the ideals of social justice upon which they are built. Marxists, anarchists, and other leftists argue that capitalism is incompatible with democracy since capitalism according to Marx entails dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, while democracy entails rule by the people. 